Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have the big pleasure to welcome you to for tonight's um, talk. Um, this is part of a whole series that its aim is to highlight certain aspects of the exhibition and to go into depth or to raise new questions. And tonight I have the immense pleasure to um, welcome Professor Christiane, Christine Gruber. And she's speaking about the prophet as a sacred spring, late Ottoman Ilya bottles. Um, Professor Gruber is one of the leading scholars in the field of Islamic art. And from 2005 to 2011, she was assistant professor at Indiana University in Bloomington. Afterwards, from 2011 to 2018, associate professor at the University of Michigan. And in spring 2012, she spent a semester as Arnheim professor at Humboldt University in Berlin, and a year later as visiting professor at the Sorbonne in Paris. And since 2018, Christine Gruber is professor at the University of Michigan. And let us shortly go back to the year 2005 when she gained her PhD um, with a dissertation which was called The Prophet Muhammad's Ascension in Islamic Art and Literature. And this is exactly um, the first field of her expertise. She became very well known for that. In 2010, she um, published the Ilkhani Book of Ascension, Ascension, I'm sorry. And in 2019, the praiseworthy one, the Prophet Muhammad in Islamic texts and images. Um, and you can easily imagine that her research was paramount for the preparation of the exhibition in the name of the image. And I literally, Devoured the two last publications of Professor Gruber. And I used her knowledge um, for my preparation, of course. And you may also understand how delighted I am to welcome Professor Gruber and to thank her for accepting not only the invitation to contribute to the exhibition catalog, but also to give a virtual talk today um, for our public. Um, Christine, um, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, warm congratulations to you on your show. Uh, my father who lives in Geneva just two days ago sent me an article in the Geneva Tribune asking me if I was aware of this show. And I said, well, yes, I'm aware of the show. So it's reached my, my father's attention. Um, I'm really pleased that you put together a show that was timely and necessary. And thank you for all the wonderful conversations that we've had and for also including some Islamic and Christian icon bottles in the show, which really haven't been studied uh, very much. So that was uh, a really important element also for scholarship. Uh, tonight, I'm especially thrilled uh, to be here and speaking virtually at Museum Rietberg because uh, I've been active in the field for about a quarter of a century now, but I have never once given a talk in Switzerland, which is my home country. Uh, I've talked in Iran and uh, Cairo and Istanbul and everywhere in Europe, but not you know, in my Hevesian uh, patria. So thank you for bringing me home uh, in this virtual way. I'm tonight beaming in from Istanbul. So apologies if you hear the call to prayer. It's uh, now the time for the breaking of the fast uh, here in Turkey. So the uh, Azan might uh, be, be inspiriting uh, my own talk. Um, today's talk is indeed about uh, icon bottles. It's a subject I've written about a little bit in the catalog essay, but for those of you who might wanna pick up and read a little bit more, uh, I believe that uh, we can put the link to the article in the chat so you can download that article uh, for free as a PDF if you want to follow up on the research. So without further ado, let me just share my screen and begin tonight's presentation. Does this look okay to everybody? Yeah, okay, good. So tonight's talk is on the prophet as a sacred spring, late Ottoman Hilie bottles. The Topkapı Palace Library in Istanbul 
is one of the world's largest and most important repositories of Islamic paintings and manuscripts. It thus came as a surprise to me when after more than a dozen years of research in the collections, the librarian at the time, Zeynep Chilik Atbash, pulled me aside a few years ago to tell me that I should take a look at some glass bottles, which remain relatively unknown and unpublished, and yet surely would interest me. Zeynep could not have been more correct in her assessment. I was left astounded when the staff brought out four large glass bottles into the manuscript reading room. These were no books. Instead, before me were three bottles containing hilyes, or verbal descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad, while a fourth bottle housed a miniature Quran displayed on a wooden stand decorated with colorful beads. So here is our bottle and here is the Quran. And I, here I show you a detail of this tiny miniature Quran nestled within the bottle. Executed by the underglass painter Mehmed Refat and dated 1891, this bottle has at least four companion pieces held in two other museums in Istanbul. Although I will not discuss Quran bottles today, their production alongside Hilya bottles suggests that these glass containers were intended to house both the icon of God through the Quran, as well as the icon of the Prophet Muhammad through the Hilya. Although new findings surely will emerge in the coming years, at present I have been able to identify about a dozen Hilya bottles in international collections, and further thanks to Axel Langer, some others have come to light, including in Swiss collections. While one bottle appeared on the art market some years ago under the title of Lodge Hilie or Teke Hiliese, and another Hilie bottle is dated 1805 and currently in display in the Meble Vihane Museum in Galata in Istanbul, and I showed that on the screen. It is evident from the Topkapı Palace icon bottles that these materials should not be restricted to Sufi or spiritual practitioners or lodges and other such milieus alone. Rather, these rare objects appear to have been used in palace quarters for both talismanic and curative purposes. Their therapeutic role in particular is suggested by the Hilya's use in the production of gold powder, which in all likelihood was combined with water drawn either from local sacred springs in Istanbul, or else holy water collected from the Zamzam well in Mecca. As a result, these Hilya bottles, I will argue tonight, provided a new kind of prophetic pharmacon, whereby Muhammad was reified, as well as symbolically ingested, as the ultimate elixir vitae. Since Hilya bottles remain to be studied in greater detail, let us first begin with a close visual and material examination of all three objects. Measuring 42 centimeters in height, the first bottle, which you see here, has a tall golden finial wrapped in a green silk ribbon, and it is by far the largest in the group. Moreover, its interior is lavishly decorated with a vertical gilt rod whose horizontal perches are capped with dangling pearl ornaments. So here is the rod in the middle, and here are some branches, and we've got some nice little pearl ornaments that dangle from within. Other decorations fill the interior of the bottle and include wicker branches, flowers made of brown and white fabric, and round beads made of green and red plastic, the latter a modern material. This panoply of decorative items comes together to form what we might call Hilia installation art, itself intended to be remain undisturbed thanks to the wax sealing the flask's neck. So obviously this was not supposed to be used. It's completely sealed off by this, this wax at the top. Thus the bottle's contents were meant to remain in place and inaccessible in this very particular form. Two of the four bottle sides display the hilie, 
which records Ali's verbal description of Muhammad's physical and moral characteristics set into a diagrammatic form that was invented by the famous 17th century Ottoman calligrapher Hafiz Osman. Here, the typical Hilya layout with its central circle or omphalos surrounded by the four Rashidun is readily recognizable. So here is the central roundel or omphalos, and oftentimes it's surrounded by four other roundels that have the name of the first four rightly guided caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali right here. Also quite typical is the inclusion of depictions of Mecca and Medina. Here is Mecca, here is Medina as top pieces, as well as the Quranic verse praising Muhammad with the exclamation, quote, you were sent as nothing but a mercy to all the universes. So right here is more visible. What arsalna ille rahma lil alameen. That's straight out of the Quran and it describes Muhammad as a mercy to all of mankind. More remarkably, uh, however, the Bismillah, or in the name of God, at the top here of both panels <clears throat> is surmounted by the Quranic expression. Indeed, it is from Solomon. So here you can see, Inna min Sulayma wa innahu Bismillah rahman rahim This added clause, verily it is from Solomon, refers to Solomon's protective powers. And oftentimes this particular verse from the Quran is inscribed in Islamic talismans because Solomon was considered to be uh, a powerful white magician of sorts who can control the winds and the spirits. The Solomonic statement hints at the item's protective or talismanic function. And indeed Hilias were often used as amulets in Ottoman lands during the 18th and 19th centuries. Some, like the panel of cutout work right here in the middle, include a number of talismanic devices to protect their viewers. Still other Helias, such as this plaque right here, now in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, were engraved in metal and used to produce printed amulets. So this is a metal stamp in reverse. Just like other hilias painted on panels and included in manuscripts, these metal objects also were outfitted with designs and Quranic verses that were believed to be particularly protective. The hilias bottle's prophylactic or protective qualities are further strengthened by the verses of Persian poetry affixed to the bottle's two other sides. So we have two sides with the Hilya and two sides with Persian poetry. And I show you here the, the two sides of poetry, which I will uh, give you here in English translation. The verses appear to include some misspellings in Persian, thereby suggesting an Ottoman Turkish authorship. Despite a few lingering linguistic issues, the verses read as follows, quote, O oh Lord, place this divine shadow on the throne of perpetuity and illuminate the sun of the royal sky in perpetual heaven, end quote. So that's one panel. And then the second panel reads, and I quote, whoever keeps this beautiful hilly at home will be saved from spiritual suffering, poverty, sadness, persecution, and calamities. When God, his pure being, out of mere mercy allows it, then without a doubt, the owner benefits very much from the Prophet Muhammad's descriptions, end quote. The first panel of Persian poetry praises God through a series of celestial and cosmic metaphors, while the second panel addresses the bottle's owner directly by reminding him or her of the Helia's shielding capacities, especially in the home, or the term is khane in Persian here. Moreover, by stressing the supremacy of God, these verses make it clear that this item is not to be considered a tool in the practice of black magic, but rather a permissible form of harnessing protective energies according to the Solomonic method. As a result, the first Helia bottle essentially encases a verbal icon of the Prophet Muhammad and turns it into an amuletic form of installation art that was meant to protect individuals 
within a domestic setting. So that's our first bottle. The second Helia bottle similarly preserves two Helia panels, but here the paper folios are mounted on rather thick wooden boards that are separated by a long rod wrapped in red silk, a detail to which I will return momentarily. At its top, the bottle is outfitted with a rope and metal chain. So here is our metal chain and here is a rope. So there are two suspendables. And so it appears that the bottle was potentially carried on occasion rather than permanently exhibited on a flat surface such as a table or a shelf. The Heliot text is also placed within an omphalos or a roundel, here girdled by a gold crescent, and once again surrounded by the Rashidun, the four rightly guided caliphs. So here is the gold crescent moon around the roundel here, which is slightly different. In this instance, however, no mention of Solomon is made. Rather, the first panel's horizontal registers running along the frame include the Bismillah, or in the name of God, and the Quranic verse of mercy, which you see uh, here on the right. We've already seen it in the previous bottle. But the second panel, which we see here, and which I'll zoom in uh, right now, also includes at its top the famous Lauleke Hadith Qudsi, and a hadith Qudsi is a saying that is uttered directly by God uh, in the Islamic tradition. So here it's God speaking, and here he's recorded as saying, quote, were it not for you, O Muhammad, I would not have created the heavenly spheres. So it's basically God saying that the heavens were created for the prophet Muhammad. So that's the hadith Qudsi, or the saying by God at the top. And at the bottom, it also includes the signature of the calligrapher, a certain Munla or Mevlana Mehmed, uh, whom uh, I have yet to identify and various colleagues have not been able to identify either as of yet. These two Hilier panels are augmented with Ottoman devotional poetry in honor of the prophet. Although their meter is not entirely correct, the first two verses read as follows, quote, your pure name is on the highest throne, Muhammad Mustafa. Your figure is a cypress, and your station is from Tuba to Muntaha. And I'll describe these terms in a minute. Here, the prophet is said to have his name inscribed on God's throne, a motif that is rather pervasive in Islamic ascension texts and images. And his cosmic stature or station is so vast that it is said to stretch from the upside down cosmic tree known as the Tuba tree, all the way to the loach tree of the limit known as Sidrat al-Muntaha. So these are the two large cosmic trees that are at the end of the cosmos. So we have cosmic trees that describe the station of the prophet in one of the Ottoman Turkish verses. And then the next two verses can be identified as penned by the famous 16th century Ottoman poet Zati. They exclaim, quote, O oh, embellishment of the garden of illocality, your station is a cypress of light. It casts no shadow on the ground, end quote. In these verses, the prophet is described as a fine figured entity like a cypress, meaning a uh, thin waisted, that bears no shadow, as well as a cosmic ornament not bound by time or space. And that's the notion of illocality or lemekan uh, in Arabic, that he doesn't belong to any time or spatial dimension whatsoever. Taken all together, these figures of speech and motifs used in all four Ottoman Turkish verses added to this hilye make clear reference to Muhammad's celestial ascension, so his mi'raj, the celebration of which occurred in palace quarters to the accompaniment of praise poetry and the illumination of hanging lamps known as candil. Perhaps then this particular Hilie bottle was suspended or ritually carried during mi'raj or other religious festivities that were held in palace quarters. 
The bottle's possible suspension is certainly suggested by the metal rope, metal chain and rope that are wrapped around its neck. So it seems like a suspendable, and that would make sense for a candil or a lamp festivity of some sort. Other evidence for its use is suggested by the vertical rod that resembles a perfume dauber. And this is the rod right here. So if you are to hold uh, the top of the rod and go like this, it starts to move inside the bottle. When rocked back and forth by this removable cap, the interior rodule or dauber scrapes the backsides of both Hillier panels in the process producing a gold dust that could have been collected and extracted from the bottle thanks to a slightly dampened red silk fabric. So imagine the silk being slightly moist and then it's scratching at the back of these panels. And I'll show you a detail of the back. This includes a, a gold leaf and then that becomes dust. And then you could extract uh, the gold dust just like you would essential oil. Indeed, the gold flecks at the bottom of the flask do not appear to be the haphazard result of wear over time. Rather, it becomes clear from the object's material makeup that the main goal of this particular glass bottle consisted in the production of gold Hillier dust. In order to achieve this aim, the artisan affixed gold painted papers to the back of both wooden Hillier panels. One, as you can see on the right, right here, still retains its gold pigments in relatively good condition. So we've got a nice piece of gold paper right here. While the second on the left has witnessed the near total loss of its gilt backing, no doubt due to repeated chafing at the same angle. So there was a gold paper at the back of this panel and it's completely gone because of all the, the scraping. Thus, unlike the previous talismanic Hillier bottle that was intended for artful display and protection in the home, this item was meant to be used in some fashion or another. Turning, and this is where evidence from the third bottle helps us interpret a little bit that gold dust. So turning to the third and last Hillier bottle in the Topkapi Palace, it appears to have fulfilled a similar function. It contains only one wooden panel whose two sides are fixed with folios containing Mohammed's verbal icon. So the description of Mohammed's features, uh, moral and physical. Several details are noteworthy as we move up towards the top of the flask. First and most conspicuously, this bottle is neither sealed shut, nor is it provided with a removable cap, like our first two examples. Instead, the Hillier panel is affixed to a metal wire that curves in the flask's neck, which rises slightly above the opening of the bottle. So here is the uh, affixment with the metal wire. And as it makes its way up into the neck of the bottle, it actually curves up and makes a kind of handle uh, out of the, this one metal. This metal handle must have been used by an individual to set in motion, shake, or rock the hillier within the container, a kinetic action that resulted in visible interior scrape marks and a loss of gold pigment on the bottle's lateral sides. So there are lots of scrape marks on the sides because this, uh, this panel made out of wood is scraping at the inside of uh, the lateral walls. So two walls are being scraped. Those two walls also carry deeper symbolic import because they're covered in monumental inscriptions. And these are the, the walls that are being scraped with inscriptions that proclaim, quote, verily he illuminated the world with the light of Muhammad. So here it is, Kadnawaraha Dunya Binuri Muhammadin, right here. So here, God's creation of the Prophet's light, known as Nur Muhammad, as radiant flux, appears equated with gold pigment ornamenting the fast sides. 
So here the gold suggests that it is supposed to be equated with the light of Muhammad, a primordial sacred substance. In turn, this lustrous high luxury material could be transformed into gold dust or powder by setting Muhammad's verbal icon to motion within the glass container. So see here, you see how much of that gold dust has actually fallen off by scraping. And that gold dust is equated to the light of Muhammad, radiant in its gilt uh, luminosity. A close visual and material examination of these three Hilya bottles leads us to a number of preliminary conclusions. Depending on use and location, such items could be shut, opened on demand, or permanently kept ajar. One functioned as a Muhammad centered talismanic art object destined to protect an individual in their home. In their latter case, no further interactions were necessary. In other cases, however, a chain and a rope suggest more ritualistic uses, including caring or suspension in festive commemorations of the prophet or other religious holidays, including the celebration of his celestial ascension. In such cases, a removable cap and silk covered stopper enabled the collection and extraction of gold flecks, rubbed off the gilt papers lining the helia panel's backsides. Lastly, in at least one instance, this gold dust or pigment is equated with the Nur Muhammad, the light of Muhammad, itself the primordial and generative material used by God to create the entire world before the physical appearance of the prophet Muhammad himself. These newly uncovered Heliot bottles raise a number of issues concerned with late Ottoman artistic traditions as they intersect with devotional practices dedicated to the prophet Muhammad, especially in a larger Istanbul setting. Perhaps the two most important questions that arise are first, what were the uses and purposes of creating gold dust? That's a major question. Why make gold dust? And second, what are the origins and therefore the symbolic meanings of these icon bottles? How did these icon bottles emerge as, um, as objects themselves? Examining related artistic evidence can help us expand and refine our range of possible interpretations Chief among them, the bottle's likely use in late Ottoman magical medicinal practices that involved the mixing of sacred dust or soil with holy water in order to produce liquid suspensions and curative potions believed saturated with prophetic baraka or blessings. So let us look at some of the related evidence, starting first with manuscripts from the Ottoman period. During the 18th and 19th centuries, hilyes were believed to protect individuals, their belongings, and especially their homes. Their talismanic energies were believed latent and activated through a number of practices, most especially their viewers' gaze, rubbing, and kissing. A number of late Ottoman illustrated prayer books, known as du'a namez, or books of prayers, include specific directions on how to make use of such haptic or physical practices, which were believed to unleash the dormant blessings contained most especially in Muhammad's verbal icon, his relics, and other marks and traces. For example, one devotional manuscript made in 1766, which you see here, includes a double-page depiction of the prophet's hilye, topped by the widespread invocation seeking refuge from the cursed uh, devil. The icon's position as a potent refuge is further strengthened by the addition of a short instructional text attributed to Atirmidhi, which you see right here. So this is a text attributed to Atirmidhi, which continues at the bottom of each Helia panel and on subsequent folios. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Atirmidhi, 
Um, he is a famous Hadith compiler and also an author of a, a book on the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad, known as Shama'il uh, al Nabi. So, a Tirmidhi, this author, is recorded in Ottoman Turkish and not in Arabic as informing the reader that the Prophet's holy seal, so this was, you know, a, a seal uh, between his shoulder blades, contains many virtues or merits. Among them, we are told that whoever looks at the seal, so the seal in the manuscript, in the morning after having performed ablutions, will be protected from all disasters and catastrophes until the end of the day. The same holds true that if you look at the seal at the beginning of the month and at the beginning of the year, so it will protect you all through the month or all through the year. It will also protect you if you look at it at the beginning of a trip, you'll stay safe during the trip. Finally, whoever gazes on it during the year of his death will end his life, we're told, in faith by the grace of God the Almighty. In still other prayer books, a Tirmidhi is cited on the necessity of rubbing, so of physically rubbing this seal of prophecy to one's face or eyes, thus proving that the intense looking at Muhammad's icons and signs, combined with the scraping of the pigments, were believed to secure safeguard from tragedy, including damnation in the afterlife. Other late Ottoman paintings depicting marks and places related to the Prophet Muhammad display telltale signs of intrusive interactions with their gold pigments. For example, one depiction of the Prophet's footprint, which you see right here in the Topkapı Palace, displays heavy chafing in its gold center, most likely due to its viewers' repeated rubbing or kissing of the image. So notice here that the foot, the gold is really rubbed in the center. And here you see a detail of, of that rubbing, so much so that the gold seems to have been scraped away. Similarly, a gold flame-like rendering of Muhammad's seal of prophecy right here on the right, inscribed in its center with the prophet's name and title, so uh, Muhammad Rasulullah, shows an intrusive form of rubbing, so much so that the gold pigments are seeping through the registers of text at the bottom of the now darkened folio. So somebody was smudging this down and you'll notice that these gold pigments are bleeding into the text here. So these show heavy, heavy uh, devotional intrusion. Not solely limited to Muhammad's vestiges and marks, such ardent forms of caressing sacred images also extended to depictions of Mecca and Medina, both of which are intimately associated with the prophet's life and career. A number of late Ottoman manuscripts of Al-Jazuli's Dala'il Al-Khayrat, or Proof of Good Deeds, and other similar prayer books, include double-page paintings of the two holy cities, at times tarnished with smear marks that appear as if strategic strikes. So let's zoom in here on these paintings. For example, this late 18th century copy of al Jalzuli's text displays a loss of black pigment from the kisva cloaking the Kaaba. So notice here that we should have black paint to depict the, the fabric on top of the Kaaba, but it's been smudged or kissed away. So the pigments have become fugitive. And then we also see large white and blue smudges here tainting the dome covering the Prophet Muhammad's grave uh, in Medina. So we have smudge marks of devotion where the viewers are interacting with the images in devotional ways. And that's not all, there's plenty of other evidence for this. For instance, another contemporary copy of the Dala'il al-Khirat shows similar abrasions, which appear as if caused by the wet flick of the finger placed above the dome of the Prophet and then curved kinetically across the grilled chamber containing his tomb. So here, imagine a wet thumb or a wet finger just running across the tomb of the prophet as if to want to maybe ingest the sacred soil in which he is symbolically inhumed. And yet that is not all. 
Another late Ottoman illustrated manuscript of the same text suggests that viewers actively and sometimes quite aggressively scraped pigments off of paintings of Mecca and Medina, perhaps with the aim to collect these sacred pigments on their fingers for eventual ingestion through the mouth. From Muhammad's footprint to his seal of prophecy, onward to depictions of Mecca and Medina, the evidence thus points to Ottoman practices of rubbing and kissing sacred images, as well as the collecting of pigment debris associated with the prophetic corpus and presence. Such physically enacted devotions are supported by textual evidence as well. For example, writing during the 17th century, the Ottoman explorer Evliya Celebi records in his Seyahat Name or Book of Travels, the pietistic or devotional engagements of pilgrims to Mecca and Medina, including his own. Launching into his multi-volume work, Evliya Celebi first pleads God to protect him during his sojourn with the rhetorical question, quote, might I roam the world? Might it be vouchsafed to me to reach the Holy Land, Cairo and Damascus, Mecca and Medina, and to rub my face at the sacred garden, the tomb of the prophet, glory of the universe, end quote. Here, it appears as if the ultimate goal of the author's journey is none other than the overlaying of his face with a prophetic patina extracted from the blessed soil, textiles, and grill anointed by Muhammad's inhumed body. Further, arriving in Medina, Evliya Celebi then makes his way to the railing encircling Muhammad's tomb, telling his readers that, quote, there I kissed the threshold, prayed beseechingly, and knelt down, end quote. Evliya Celebi prayed for the intercession of the Prophet Muhammad and nearly fainted. Besides kissing the grill, he also kissed the ground at Muhammad's tomb in Medina, all the while asking for Muhammad's help. Our pious traveler also records practices of devotional rubbing, especially in and around Medina. For instance, he includes a short description of a small shrine known as the Station of the Messenger, or Makame Hazret, located outside of Medina, which was shaped like a small prayer niche and housed the impression of the Prophet's noble head. That shrine doesn't exist anymore. There he goes on, quote, pilgrims rub their faces on this holy place, the place that contains a, a print, an imprint of the Prophet Muhammad's head. Such popular practices of kissing and rubbing were not at all frowned upon or prohibited as they are now under Saudi Wahhabi control. Rather, they were actively sponsored by royal Ottoman patrons who lavished great gifts upon Islam's two holy cities and even ordered the construction of new gates to the Medina mosque, including one that was inscribed with the poet verses reading, quote, God forbid that he who rubs his face on your grave should not go free, end quote. So the Ottoman sponsored gates with inscriptions basically telling the pilgrims, go ahead and rub your face on this sacred place. Ottoman devotees practices of kissing the Kizwa and the black stone in Mecca, along with the rubbing of soil and the golden grill in Medina, in order to secure the blessings and intercession of God and Muhammad, also appear to have occurred within the site's visual representations, as the painterly evidence so strongly suggests. Although it is clear that such images were touched in various ways, one question still lingers. Namely, where did the now missing pigments of this materia prophetica go? Upon affectionate kissing, did these pigments mix in with saliva and were they thus ingested by the faithful? Were the pigments 
smudged with wet fingers and then perhaps touched to the believer's lips or tongues? Or alternatively, were they collected as prophetic ingredients to be mixed in with other liquids or potions? In other words, what are the whys and wherefores of these fugitive pigments and how might they shed new light on Helia bottles as a corpus of objects? Which brings us to the next part of my talk, which is where I would like to suggest that these bottles, just like other contemporary devotional icons to the prophet Muhammad, provided a material mechanism to make and gather gold pigments. The fact that one of them mentions the Nur Muhammad leads us in part to associate such pigments with the Prophet Muhammad's primordial light, the Nur Muhammad. That two bottles included hilias meant to scrape at the inside walls further strengthens this hypothesis. In addition, during the late Ottoman period, the collecting of the water runoff from the ritual washing of the Prophet's footprint and mantle was a well-known practice in palace quarters. In other words, Muhammad's footprint, which you see right here, which is, is still in the top of the palace today, was ritually washed and the water was kept in little vials to be imbibed as a prophetic uh, elixir of sorts. So we know that other materials associated with the prophet were mixed in with water and that water was then uh, imbibed. This prophetic precipitate was then preserved in small flasks, imbibed to break the evening fast during the month of Ramadan, and also administered as a curative potion throughout the year. Libations or drinks, potions that came into contact with Muhammad's relics were understood as the ultimate panacea or ultimate antidote, and such magical medicinal liquids quite possibly included other tonics and potions into which were mixed gold prophetic precipitate that was extracted or poured out from Helia bottles. Textual sources from the time support the alchemical presumption that gold contained restorative powers, a belief that appears quite widespread in Ottoman lands during the 17th and 18th centuries. For instance, one manuscript that records the recipes for medicines and potions produced in the Topkapı Palace Pharmacy includes various antidotes, potions, pills, pastilles, syrups, and ointments, as well as balms to help with stomach aches, cosmetic products to dye hair, and soaps to maintain body hygiene and even stem hair loss. Most relevant for our purposes today, this royal pharmacopoeia also includes a number of red recipes for medicines that were made from precious metals and stones, including gold, silver, ruby, amber, and pearl. So you'll notice that I pointed out number seven because that is the chapter that describes the various antidotes that are made out of gold, altun, gumush, silver, and other kinds of metals. So there's a whole chapter on potions that use these fine metals. Let's take a look at one recipe. The one that stands out the most to me is the so-called majune kirmiz, or red potion or paste. Among others, its ingredients include rose water, amber, lapis lazuli, pearl, musk, aloe, ruby, and last but not least, gold and silver leaf, known as altun varak and gumish varak. We are told that the potion's curative and restorative powers are many, and that as a general cure-all, it is especially useful in helping with problems related to the heart, head, liver, and stomach. Moreover, it is believed to cure forgetfulness and vertigo, to make the face lighter in tone, to assist pregnant women and to prevent miscarriages, to lessen colic and indigestion in children, and to alleviate 
illness during times of plague and other epidemics, quite apropos for our pandemic times today. To produce this panacea containing crushed gold leaf, the treatise also gives directions of production and use, including the boiling of liquids, the pounding in of various ingredients, the draining of water and cooling in order to create the paste, the latter eventually preserved in jars that are made of gold, silver, and porcelain. Last but not least, in case of need, this healing blend is doled out in small amounts and mixed in with sherbet to be imbibed by those suffering from any kind of ailment. This recipe's inclusion of gold leaf or altun varak, along with its mention of pounding of its constituent ingredients, suggests that the palace's pharmacy housed rare materials, including leaves of gold, which comprise a stable consolidation of this precious metal that then could be ground into a more volatile powder whenever the need arose to manufacture a new potion. In other words, the best way to store your gold is through a leaf and not a powder. Otherwise, you might lose all of it to a gust of wind. Quite tellingly, gold pigments, flecks, and even debris are a key hallmark of two Helia bottles, while one in particular includes a gold leaf backing that is now entirely lost due to pulverization by the interior dauber covered in red silk. So remember, there was an altun varak or a gold leaf here on the back of this hilie, which has been ground up um, into dust. It is thus not unlikely that this dauber was moistened and the gold flecks gathered, perhaps to be mixed into curative elixirs like the so-called red paste. In such a case, the gold's therapeutic potential could be seen as exponentially more effective having derived from the prophet's blessed icon, the Hilie, itself encased in a precious decanter-like vessel. Individuals thus could ingest or imbibe this prophetic precipitate, whose baraka or blessings could be believed to somatically fuse with the flesh and the body of the believer. So you could symbolically ingest the prophet in these material ways. During the 18th and 19th centuries, these Helia bottles formed part of a larger production of vessels produced to contain the sacred water of the Zamzam well in Mecca as well. Known as Zamzamiyas, these flasks were made of both transparent glass and imported Chinese porcelain, their necks often fastened shut with a rope or thread in a manner reminiscent of the Helia bottles. So here is a Chinese porcelain, a jar, that was repurposed in Ottoman Istanbul as a zamzamiya, so a zamzam, a water bottle, fastened shut. And here is a 19th century glass zamzamiya, which is now in Amsterdam. What is interesting to me is that this tradition carries on today. The sacred water contained in these zamzamiyas was thought to heal the sick and bring them baraka as the carriers of Meccan blessings all the way to the present day. Indeed, Zamzam water bottles are still sold to pilgrims in the holy city of Mecca. They also remain a staple product in stores located around the Ayyub shrine here in Istanbul, which sell devotional goods, souvenirs depicting the prophet's relics, and above all, a wide range of hilies made in both monumental and miniature size. So here's a photo of the Zamzam water bottles, which look like just common water bottles that you can buy in convenience stores. But this is a store around the Ayyub shrine and you can find other devotional products along with these water bottles that are supposed to have the sacred uh, Zamzam water from, from Mecca within them. Hilia bottles formed part of a larger life world of Istanbul during the 19th and early 20th century, at which time late Ottoman Islamic devotions to the Prophet Muhammad appeared to have coincided with the cult of healing waters, 
which was shared by the city's Christian and Muslim dwellers. The belief in water's sacred and curative powers can be traced back much further in time to the numerous ancient Near Eastern holy springs, lakes, and caves around the Mediterranean basin and across the Anatolian plateau. Sacred water sources were central to Christianity as well, as can be attested by the rite of baptism, baptismal fonts, and the spread of holy springs associated with churches and chapels. In Greek, such springs are known as holy water or hagiasma, the plural is hagiasmata in Greek, and they are founded in the memory of Christ's baptism or else dedicated to a particular Christian saint. At one time, Istanbul or Constantinople counted more than 200 such springs. However, Today, most have disappeared under road, train, and building construction. After the conquest of the city by Ottoman forces in 1453, the growing local Muslim population also came to consider such springs, including Christian springs, miraculous and therapeutic, the belief in sacred water in Islam stretching back to the earliest narratives about the Zamzam well. In Ottoman and modern Turkish spheres, these springs are now known as ayazma, a term etymologically indebted to the Byzantine Christian hagiasmata in the city. Today, a number of ayazmas in Istanbul remain in operation and are even quite popular. Once a week on feast days and special occasions, they host visitors of all faiths and nationalities who come to these sacred water sites in order to make wishes, seek blessings, or ask for healing via the practices of visitation, prayer, and votive donation. Most germane for our talk tonight, these ayazmas are filled with decorative icons and bottles containing images of the Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ. The plastic bottles are filled or impressed with an icon of Mary or Christ, revealing the extent to which Helia bottles are connected to Constantinople's Christian and Islamic sacred spring traditions. And this is where we get to talk a little bit more about these sacred springs in Constantinople slash Istanbul. The oldest, most important and best known hagiasma in Istanbul is that of the Virgin known as the fountain of life or life-giving source, or known in Greek as Zuodokos Pege. This church spring complex was founded close to the city's defensive walls in the fifth or sixth centuries, either by the Byzantine emperor Leo I or by Justinian, who is best known as, of course, the patron of Hagia Sophia. Textual sources inform us that the church spring uh, was able to effectuate 47 miracles and cures between the years 450 and 950. During the Ottoman period, so after 1453, the church was destroyed and rebuilt on several occasions, at which time a story about a fried fish, uh, the word for fish in Turkish is baluk, miraculously returned to life after jumping in its spring waters, and it therefore endowed this particular uh, spring church with its current name, which is Balakler or fish-like, fishy, the fishy spring. The site was especially active during the 19th century when its church, chapel, and crypt were fully rebuilt and inaugurated in 1835 after its destruction during the Greek Revolution in 1821. In the wake of its reconsecration, the complex was visited by the Ottoman Sultan Mahmoud II, who extended financial support and showed respect to various Christian churches, their holy springs, and religious ceremonies. Right around this time, an image made by Thomas Allen and published in Robert Walsh's 1838 travel narrative to Constantinople depicts this so-called spring of the miraculous fishes at Balukle, so the Balukle shrine, populated by various visitors 
some of whom dip their feet into the holy spring or use vessels to drink its curative waters. So the spring is down here. These two individuals are actually standing in the water right here. And a couple other individuals are holding vessels that they'll use to collect uh, the waters of Zuodokospege or Balakle. As Walsh relates in his text, this lively spring was visited by both quote unquote Greeks and Turks. Those are the terms he uses. At the water source, he continues by saying, quote, priests stood around the spring with pitchers in their hands, which they constantly filled and handed up to those close to them. They were eagerly seized by every person who could catch them and poured with trembling emotion on their heads and breasts where they were rubbed so that every particle of the life-giving fluid might be imbibed by the pores of the skin, end quote. Today, the Balakla spring retains some of its most salient features, including an icon of the Virgin Mary and Christ child located immediately above the sacred waters, the latter now illuminated with electric lamps and enlivened still today by a few swimming fish. So here is the Virgin Mary holding Christ's child. And like other Byzantine icons, she's covered in a silver, uh, a silver leaf of sorts. And below that is the sacred water here that you see illuminated by lamps. And what's interesting is when you look in the water, you actually see the icon reflected in the water. So it looks like uh, the Virgin Mary and Christ's child are actually floating in the water through a, a mirror a technique. The silver encrusted wall painting above the water depicts Mary as the life-giving spring, as the Zuodokos Pege, as she bursts forth out of a source of water from which Christian priests, warriors, and devotees seek relief and cure. Moreover, in its foreground, a man in a red robe, which you see right here, is shown holding a vessel right here and pouring the sacred water into the eyes of a man most, most likely suffering from ophthalmological problems, a depiction that is very much befitting for this sacred spring because its foundation story includes a miraculous cure for blindness. So individuals with various disabilities, including blindness, would come to this spring uh, to seek uh, out healing. Although today the image appears as a wall painting, Byzantine sources describe a mosaic icon of the Virgin Mary instead, so it has since changed. This mosaic, we are told, reflected in the spring's water, making it seem as if the image were incubating within it and thus endowing the water with life. As my colleague Robert Osterhout points out, it must have been difficult for visitors to differentiate the mosaic depiction from its aquatic reflection. So perhaps it is best to say that the two, the image and the water, the icon and the aquatic substance worked in concert. Filled with the figural image of a saintly figure, as well as charged with healing powers, this new holy amalgam yielded what we might call icon water. So here we see icon water in a Byzantine hagiasma. While the icon water of the Zuodokos Pege spring most likely collected and distributed, was most likely collected and distributed in metal jugs and glass vessels in centuries prior, today's visitors, Christian, Muslim, and other, are encouraged to make a monetary donation in exchange for a plastic bottle into which they can gather the consecrated substance. Many cheap and mass produced bottles line one of the walls in the spring's crypt, waiting to be put to good use. Of handheld size and thus highly portable, each bottle identifies the Hagiasma, the Holy Spring, by name in an oval that frames an icon of Mary and Christ emerging from the fountain of life. So here is the name of our Holy Spring. Here's the Virgin Mary holding Christ, uh, Christ child as they emerge from the fountain. So this is the Zuodokos Pege, so the Virgin Mary as the source of light. 
This icon impressed bod- about this icon impressed upon the translucent body of the plastic container generates a similar effect as the mosaic image that would have reflected in the sacred spring. That is, it appears as if the image might be incubating in the water, or alternatively, that the icon is coming to life with every ripple of the liquid. These holy souvenirs are then taken away and imbibed by individuals seeking remedy or relief, their disparate faiths and worldviews united in the universal belief in water's healing powers. Another hagiasma, or sacred spring, was the spring of St. Savior Philanthropos, located in the St. George Monastery complex, which was built in the 12th century between the sea and the city's maritime walls. Because of its particular location, the spring was also referred to as the Ayasma of the Rampart, or Ayasma de la Muraille, as it was called in French, uh, and by French travelers, including by Joseph Piton de Tournefort. Around 1700, the Tournefort recorded the Ottoman Sultan's visit to this sacred spring and his observing of its mud cures during the Feast of the Transfiguration. The Tournefort says, quote, the Greeks believe that this water cures fever and also the gravest sickness, both present and future. It is for this reason that they both bring the ill to this holy spring to have them drink of its waters and also bury them into the sand up to their necks, exhuming them immediately thereafter, end quote. So what you're seeing here essentially is a mud cure, um, like you might find at a, a spa today. Located in the Mangana or Sarai Burnu area of Istanbul, this ayazma of the rampart was in fact located on the grounds of the Topkapı Palace during Ottoman times. Hence, it was in close proximity to the seat of power and the Royal Library, where the Heliod bottles remain preserved today. Textual sources inform us that several Ottoman rulers visited the spring on palace grounds to which they added a Turkish fountain in the 16th century. Thereafter, the Ayazma became known as the Pearl Pavilion or Injilikashk, and also the Pavilion of the Garden Superintendent or Bostanje Bashirkashke, because it was close to where the superintendent of the Royal Gardens was located. During the 19th century, Christians are recorded as having visited the spring, even though it was on palace grounds. So Christians were allowed to visit the spring, even though the palace was actually cordoned off. Adding royal prestige to the site, Sultan Mahmud II himself showed great respect to the church and the holy spring of St. Savior Philanthropos. For example, in 1816, he supported the Feast of the Transfiguration, which included a number of mud cures performed on the seaside. Unfortunately, it is now impossible to know whether this royal ayazma included icon bottles as it was raised to the ground in 1871 to make way for the construction of a new railroad. So the big question then becomes, were the Helia bottles now in the palace library actually Helia bottles in this palace spring? That's a question we won't be able to answer, but it's interesting to, to mull over hypothetically. Other surviving Christian icon bottles associated with monasteries, churches, and sacred springs, both within and beyond Turkey, suggest that these types of religious wares would have been readily available to both Christian and Muslim individuals. Within Turkey, local Greek inhabitants known as Rum uh, or uh, Rumelians owned their own sacred water bottles, at times having brought such items back from pilgrimages abroad. For example, one icon bottle, which was purchased from an Istanbul antique store in 2016, 
displays the icons of the Virgin Mary and Christ child with Saint Eleutherius, uh, the patron saint of pregnant women, on one side of its icon bottle. So here's the Virgin Mary Christ child and Saint Eleutherius, the patron saint of pregnant women. And while the other side right here shows a depiction of the Annunciation, so the angel Gabriel coming to the Virgin Mary, uh, above an image of St. George uh, slaying the dragon. Tucked between these two scenes appears a representation of the monastery. So here you'll see a monastery, the monastery of the Virgin of the Annunciation located on Tinos, one of Greece's uh, Cyclades islands. The sacred architectural complex includes the Church of the Virgin Mary with all graces, which is dedicated to the Annunciation. As one of the foremost Christian pilgrimage sites in Greece, this church on Tinos includes a miraculous icon of Mary, which was putatively discovered in 1823 and today is placed over its hagiasma, its sacred spring. This bottle was therefore most likely acquired in the 19th or earlier 20th century by a Christian Istanbulite who wished to own a keepsake from his or her pilgrimage to the miraculous icon, as well as to bring back home the blessings associated with its nearby sacred water source. This icon bottle thus continues and adapts the centuries old production of Christian pilgrimage flasks. Perhaps more to the point, this and other Christian icon vessels recall the first Helia bottle that we saw, which similarly is sealed shut, includes displays of architectural representations of pilgrimage sites, not a monastery, but Mecca and Medina, and also has a number of ornaments, such as wicker branches and plastic beads. And uh, just to bring some, one of the objects from uh, the show in Zurich, here I show you another Christian icon bottle, which includes a number of depictions of Jesus Christ, Mary, and it also has these, uh, these little flowers included in the flask, which you find also in the Islamic version of these icon flasks. Other sacred sites and springs located within Turkey have spurred visitations from individuals across religious divides. Among them, the church complex of Demre or Mira preserves the tomb of St. Nicholas or Santa Claus, which is visited by many Christian, Muslim and secular tourists today. In recent years, the site has been restored and substantially developed to sustain an increasing influx of Russian Orthodox Christian pilgrims. When I visited Demre in 2017, I witnessed a number of Russian pilgrims rubbing the glass vitrine behind which is located the saint's tomb. So the tomb of Saint Nicholas is behind this uh, glass case. And there was a long line of uh, Russian Christian tourists who were rubbing and kissing the case. And they were also inserting written wishes into uh, the tomb. Upon exiting the church, Russian and other visitors are then encouraged to enter several large stores developed and managed by Russian companies. Among their devotional objects can be found Quranic talismans, Christian icons, and sets of miniature glass bottles, as you can see on the right here, containing the soil, oil, and water associated with the nearby tomb of St. Nicholas. So we have three holy substances here uh, that are associated with a Christian saint. That's soil, oil, and water. Upon my inquiring, the salesperson informed me that should I feel unwell or fall ill, I should either imbibe or rub these consecrated substances on my physical self. Their efficacy, he continued, was tried and tested, and my and any other purchaser's faith or lack thereof was of no consequence whatsoever. So this is efficient for anybody of any religion or of no religion at all. The same appears to hold true for Istanbul's ayazmas, which today are visited by thousands of Christians and Muslims on their respective feast days. 
On the Prince's Islands, the keeper of the church of St. George Monastery in Buyukada is a Muslim woman. So we have a church that is uh, protected or kept by a Muslim woman who informs visitors that St. George is equated with Khidr, the Muslim saint who is said to have discovered the spring of light. Moving to the Anatolian side of Istanbul, the Ayazma of St. Catherine in Moda, which you see here on the screen, also hosts Muslim pilgrims, even though it's a Christian site, including one Muslim woman who is recorded as having visited the site in order to break a spell that was cast upon her. Additionally, during two summers in 2017, I myself visited the Ayazma or the spring of Ayinbiri or the first of the month, a church in Umkapana. And I witnessed there Christian and Muslim women symbolically opening Christian icons with small metal keys right before collecting the spring's holy water in purpose-made plastic bottles. So what I'm going to do now is show you a very short clip where you see secular Muslim and Christian women all using small metal keys to symbolically unlock icons before they get to the waters. So here, as you can see in this short ethnographic video, a Muslim visitor's unlocking of a Christian icon's power and her collecting of the Christian spring's water that she also believes is sacred, prove especially noteworthy when one considers both the origins and functions of late Ottoman Helia bottles. In other words, the, the veiled woman has absolutely no problems with the icon or with the idea of an icon bottle, which is evidently indebted to Christian traditions. The Christian belief in the therapeutic power of Holy Spring and icon water appears to have migrated over to Ottoman Muslim beliefs and practices, which to a certain extent still remain visible in Istanbul's sacred springs still today. The cult of water in the city and across the region goes back centuries. However, during the 19th century, contacts between Christians and Muslims, especially at their shared sacred springs, must have prompted an increased exchange in symbolic objects as well. Among them can be counted Christian icon bottles, which may have catalyzed Hylia bottles, the latter transforming a figural icon of Christ into a verbal depiction of the prophet Muhammad. Whether catering to the Christian or Muslim faith, these types of curative icon bottles nevertheless are united in their indebtedness to age-old hydrotherapeutic traditions to which they all added creative new twists. There we go. So let me conclude uh, briefly. Based on a close visual and material analysis of these uh, newly discovered Helia bottles, related Ottoman icons and paintings, vessels for Zamzam water, and Istanbul's Holy Spring culture and objects, it appears likely that Islamic icon bottles essentially provided a new type of prophetic pharmacon in Ottoman lands, including in palace spheres during the late 19th century. At this time, the prophet's verbal icon transformed from an amuletic object of visual meditation to an encased relic, whose golden byproduct was most likely mixed into medicinal paste or zamzam water and eventually destined to be ingested and therefore alloyed with the body of the faithful. Like the famous Meccan well, the prophet therefore could symbolically function as a spring of belief and cure. If some Helia bottles were used for the production of gold pow powder, this powder may have been blended into the so-called red paste, which an archival document of the late 18th century 
notes as exclusively reserved for the Sultan. In such a case, these objects were largely, but not exclusively, royal products, and their use and inspiration may have been connected to the seaside holy spring that was located on palace grounds and which hosted mud cures. In the end, Heliobottles facilitated a number of pious engagements with a bottled prophet of sorts. Such interactions involved multiple senses, especially sight, touch, and taste, which may have included feast-specific prayers and also libations. Late Ottoman multisensorial practices that involved the imbibing of prophetic baraka thus heralded a new turn in Muhammad-centered devotional products as these intersected with early medical practices in elite spheres, as well as popular practices undertaken by both Christian and Muslim visitors to Istanbul's numerous uh, sacred springs. Like other healing tonics, these products essentially provided a new kind of prophetic antidote, promising cure for illness and a long life. They also reasserted Muhammad's supreme standing as a wellspring of belief and as the ultimate healing agent, ready to be primed, gathered, absorbed, and thus fully embodied by his pious followers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your, well, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. It's um, incredibly interesting what you found. And it's exactly in the way of the exhibition to compare these two cultures. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I try to see if there are questions. I think there is no, no. I can't see um, any question from the public. So we'll wait for another minute. If somebody wants to start on something then. I'm happy to take any questions. No, but I think it was so conclusive. There is hardly <laughs> any question. I be, left, I left no, no, no wiggle room for doubt. <laughs> But when was this first brought to your attention, this um, Heliot Bottles? Um... Uh, about, I would say, five years ago. And it's entirely thanks to my colleague, Zeynep Celik Atbash. The, uh, at the time, she was the head of the library. Now she's the head curator at Turk Bay Islam, the Turkish and Islamic Art Museum here in Istanbul. Um, she had organized a show that you might be familiar with uh, called Ashkenebi or Love of the Prophet. There was a show in Topkapı that she curated um, and she put all of this devotional material uh, dedicated to the Prophet Muhammad in the show. And then of course she found these bottles but she didn't know quite what to do with them, how to interpret them or what they were. So she actually didn't include them in the show. And in the after the show closed and I went back to the library to look at manuscripts, she of course knew that I uh, was finishing my book on devotional materials to the prophet. She said, I need to show you something because I don't understand it and you're gonna be really interested. I said, please go ahead. And I was extremely surprised when huge, very large glass bottles came out, which really don't belong in a manuscript library. And she said, you should write an article about it. I said, okay, let's do it. Huh? And that, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I did. So for me, what's really interesting in, in this scenario is that uh, librarians and curators really hold the key um, to our, our progress in, in, in findings and uh, new hypotheses. So without uh, Zeynep knowing about these objects, uh, existence and without her actively bringing them out to me, I wouldn't know about them either. So it's it's a testament to the, the friendship and the collaboration between scholars and curators, scholars and librarians. There's a lot of give and take. Uh, and so I, I, my research was entirely propelled by a curatorial colleague of mine in this case, this particular case. Well, fantastic. It's also a good story. I mean, the whole thing is brilliant. Um, well, I'm unfortunate there are no no questions. So, well, it's up to me to thank you again. Um, I mean, I'm 
quite curious what you will do next, of course. <laughs> and I wish you good luck. And thank you again for your collaboration, not only um, this talk now, but also for your brilliant article in the catalog. It was a mm. big pleasure to work with you and I wish you the best. And I hope our ways will cross in the near future. Absolutely. So thank you also for everybody who listened to us. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that perhaps I will see one or the other person um, live um, at the next um, event, which will be on the um, 11th of May. Well, thank you very much. And good night. Thank you. Goodbye.